unfolded as it ought to be, right? Good morning. It's good to be with you. It's good to be back uh, with you this morning after a few weeks away. Um, again, uh, my few weeks away went fast and yet feels like I was gone for a long time. Uh, and so it's, it's really good to be home and good to be back with you. However, uh, after Earl and I got home uh, Monday night and uh, we had some cold weather and snow this week, I, as far as the weather is concerned, I was ready to go back. That was very nice there. Uh, so uh, my two-week course uh, was quite demanding, um, uh, academically, intellectually, uh, but, but it was good. Um, and at the end of the two weeks, Arla joined me and we spent last weekend uh, in Myrtle Beach, uh, which was nice and uh, beautiful and rich history. Um, and, uh, and we had a good weekend together, but it's good to be home and it's certainly good to be here with you to worship God and fellowship as his people together. Uh, just a few announcements before we continue in our worship this morning. Uh, I'm sure as many of, as, of you have already, uh, but we wanna, as a congregation, uh, express our love and sympathy to the Vendreesen family um, in the passing of Charlie's sister, Rosa Scheppel, uh, who was laid to rest uh, this past week, and also to Barry and Jody, of course, in Elmer Bunnemus' uh, death this past week as well. Let us continue to remember these families in our prayers as they grieve as those who have hope, a living hope in a, in a living Savior. Uh, just make note that tonight there are no evening activities here. However, we are invited to Trinity CRC at 6 p.m. for their evening worship service. Uh, this is, as far as I know, this is a combined service with the three CRCs in Rock Valley, First, Calvin, Trinity, uh, and we're, we're invited, and I believe also Inwood CRC, um, a combined worship service, and uh, Jewel Mendlick, the president of Calvin Seminary, is going to be given the sermon. Um, and when you hear president of the seminary, you might think, oh, he's a highfalutin intellectual academic. Uh, Jewel is a very down-to-earth uh, good man. Uh, grew up on a hog farm in Fulton, Illinois. Uh, and so he knows rural, small-town, Midwest Christian reform culture very well. That's what he grew up in. And so I, I, I can encourage you and assure you that if you were to attend tonight, I think you would enjoy the combined worship experience, but you would also enjoy hearing uh, from Jewel as well. Um, he is a good man and a good, a good leader. And so make note of that. Um, one correction. Uh, as far as a date goes, and that is my error, uh, the uh, announcement about uh, nominees for elder and deacon, the very last sentence of that announcement uh, regarding uh, casting of lots, that will be on Sunday morning, November 24, not 17. We'll vote next Sunday morning, following uh, morning worship, uh, to affirm or not affirm each of these four nominees, and then the following Sunday morning, the 24th, uh, we'll cast lots to determine the office bearers. And then finally, uh, there are sign-up sheets, I believe, on the, the back table. Not by the mailboxes, but just on the other side of the, the windows there. Uh, to sign up to, to both attend the Thanksgiving meal on Sunday morning the 24th and to bring food items. And so please sign up if you uh, intend to uh, attend and are willing to bring some food items for that time of food and fellowship together. We're here to worship God. So let's bow our heads together in a moment of silent prayer as we come before our God in worship.
praise team comes forward to lead us in song. Uh, hear this call to worship the word of the Lord through the Apostle Paul uh, to his friend Titus and to the whole people of God from Titus chapter 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Let us worship our God in song, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. each morning. Here the, the title of this devotion this morning was this, Falling Down, Not Nodding Off in Our Worship of God. And it continues that theme. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sing uh, this short song one time, We Fall Down. And then I want to share this prayer with you, Falling Down, Not Nodding Off in Our Worship of God. Of course, some of us are prone to, to nod off in worship, right? And, and if I were in your seat, Listening to myself preach, maybe I'd be nodding off in worship as well. 
There's no condemnation for that. But worship ought to excite us. Worship ought to invigorate us. Worship ought to make us come alive. And so let's sing this song one time through, and then Joy will continue to play. I want to share this prayer with you, and then we'll sing it again a second time. gather and worship and we come before our covenant God, our covenant making and covenant keeping God, recognizing that God never breaks covenant with us, but we break covenant with him each and every day and in, in thought and word and in deed by the things that we do and by the things that we fail to do. We know because of God's covenant with us and to us that has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ, we know we're forgiven of all of our sins, past and present and future, and yet we recognize also at the same time that we continue to sin, 
And part of being in right relationship with God is that we simply, especially in corporate worship, but also privately as well, is that we acknowledge and we confess our sin in an ongoing way, even though God has dealt with it already once and for all through Jesus Christ. And so here, this call to confession, the word of the Lord through the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 1, John writes by the Holy Spirit, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves And the truth is not in us. With that invitation, would you bow your heads with me as we together corporately, but also privately and individually confess our sin to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess to you indeed that we are sinners. And yet, because of Jesus Christ, we're also saints. We confess to you, God, that we have and we do sin against you each day in thought and word and indeed by the things that we do and by the things that we fail to do. Lord, in your mercy, forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we might walk in your ways and delight in your will and glory in your holy name. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of sins, the complete forgiveness of sins, all of them, that is ours in Jesus Christ, through his finished work on our behalf, his perfect life on our behalf, his sacrificial death on our behalf, his rising from the dead and his victory over death on our behalf, and his ascending to your right hand of blessing and favor on our behalf his constant and continual interceding on our behalf and his promise to one day soon come again for us and take us to the place that he's, he has prepared for us. God, we thank you for every spiritual blessing that is ours in Jesus Christ. And in the quiet of our hearts now, in this moment of silence, hear the confessions of our individual hearts and lives. Lord, have mercy on us, for we are sinners. Claim your mercy, your grace, your kindness, and your compassion in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. The Apostle John, by the Holy Spirit, continues to write in 1 John, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness that is ours through Christ and through faith in him. I invite you to bow your heads with me again as we come before our God in a time of congregational prayer this morning. Let us pray. Good and gracious and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's good to be in your house this morning. It's good to be together with your people and in your presence in a special way in worship. Indeed, you've told us in your word and you've promised to us that you are always present with us everywhere we go. But you've also made clear in your word that you are with us in a special way when we assemble together in corporate worship. And so, Lord, we thank you for your presence here in that special way this morning as we gather together as your people in worship and in fellowship and And as we've sung about this morning and as we've prayed, Lord, may each one of us in our hearts and in our minds and with our very lives, may we fall down before you in worship. May we acknowledge that you are God, that you are our creator, sustainer, and redeemer, that you are our all in all. That without you, we have nothing. With you, we have everything. Indeed, what a fitting reminder, the name, the title that we bear as Christian, whose root word is Christ, and it's been said before, and it'll, I'll say it again, that those last three letters tagged on to uh, the name Christ 
our name Christian, I-A-N, that they could be said to stand for, I am nothing. Indeed, it's true, without Christ, we are nothing, and we have nothing. But with Christ, we are heirs of you, God. We are co-heirs with Christ. You have called us friends, and Jesus has called us his brothers and sisters. We are the family of God. And we not only bear your image, having been created by you in your image and in your likeness, but you have and you are and you will recreate us in your perfect image. Indeed, we are being conformed and transformed into the image of Christ. We have been justified, saved from the penalty of our sin. We are being sanctified, saved from the power of sin. One day soon, we will be glorified saved from the very, of present, the very presence of sin, and we will be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll be perfect in thought, in word, in deed, in body, and in soul, as your love is perfected in us and through us, and sin will not reside in us anymore. What a wonder, what a glorious thought that is. We've never known a, a moment, not even a second of our lives, where sin hasn't resided within us, but the day is coming soon where it, when it will no longer reside within us. It will no longer have a grip on us, a hold on us, an influence on us. That's because you, God, who began a good work in us, you've promised. You've promised to continue and carry on that good work until the day of Christ Jesus. You start what you finish. Indeed, we who have been predestined and called and justified, we will be glorified. And in a sense, it's already so. And so, God, we worship you. We worship you in spirit and in truth this day, for you are the one, the true, the only God, the only God who saves. So we worship you. And we pray that as we do, that you indeed would dwell within our praises that you would lift up our hearts to your throne of grace, that we would taste and see again that you are good, very, very good, and that we would know the faith and the hope and the love that you've called us to and that you've gifted us with, even as we look forward to the day when our faith is sight and our hope is fully realized, love is perfected in us, God, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness, your compassion and your grace to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up to you those grieving families among, among us. We think of the Vendresen family, who amongst their siblings, at least some time ago, this would have been unexpected that they would have buried the youngest sibling first. And so, Lord, we pray for, for Rosa Scheffel, we know that she is your child, and that because she is, she's alive and well now, in your presence, in the fullness of joy. We pray for her family, her husband, her children, grandchildren, siblings, friends. Lord, we thank you that we trust that you were glorified in her life, and that you were also glorified in her death. We pray that you would comfort those who mourn that they might grieve as those who have a living hope and a living Savior, the one who has conquered death, the one who has brought Rosa to be with you. And so, Lord, comfort the Vendresen family. Also, Lord, we ask that you would comfort Barry and Jody and the, the Bunnema family and, and really three families, um, even perhaps some at a distance and some far removed, but three families uh, touched by Elmer's death through the three women that he was married to in his life. Lord, we thank you for your provision for Elmer throughout his life um, in, in providing uh, not only for his spiritual needs, but, but also providing him with those three helpmates as well. As you took each one of them to yourself, Lord, you, you provided his needs. And so, Lord, we thank you for, for Elmer's life. And we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your kindness in him and to him and through him. Lord, we're mindful of this day uh, in light of, of death of those that we know and love. There are many others that we could name that have died recently or even some time ago. Lord, we're all mindful that we are mortal, that our days are numbered, that our time too will come. 
And Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit and by your word and through the finished work of Christ that we would face death whenever it might come with confidence, with comfort, and with joy knowing that because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and because whoever believes in him, even though they die, yet will they live, that we all can face death whenever it might come and however it might come. We can face it with confidence, knowing that it is not the end, but really it's just the beginning. It's the doorway to life eternal through, through which we must all cross, but we can do so with confidence because Christ has crossed that door for us already and he will cross that door with us as well. And so, Lord, comfort those who mourn. Comfort them with the hope of redemption, with the hope of resurrection, and with the hope of reunion that our loved ones who lived and died in Christ are alive and well and we will see them again. We will enjoy them forever because of our Savior, the one who we also will see and enjoy forever, the one who makes all of your good gifts and blessings and promises to us possible. Lord, thank you for this past week and the work that has been done in the fields this week, past week and in recent weeks as well. Uh, again, it's been a, a difficult planting season it's been a challenging harvest season, I trust, already. Uh, but we thank you for the work that has been done, and we entrust the work that still yet needs to be done. We pray for favorable conditions for that work to continue. We pray for safety for farmers as they work with the machinery, for the increased traffic on the roads. Lord, we pray that it would go well and that it would be to your glory uh, and for the provision uh, of your people, not only locally but around the world as well. We thank you for our agricultural economy locally by which so much is produced. We thank you for fertile soil and a, and a wonderful place to live and raise crops and livestock. Lord, there are so many variables uh, that our farmers cannot control. The weather, the markets, the prices, sickness, diseases, so many things. And all of these things remind us to look to you. All of these things remind us that you're sovereign, that you're in control, and that you're good all the time, and you're good in all your ways, and that you have dealt once and for all with the curse of sin in our lives and in this world through Jesus Christ. And that curse is, is short-lived in the big scheme of things. That curse will come to an end soon. You will make, through Jesus Christ, you will make all things new. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, heaven and earth made one. Creation will be restored, regained, redeemed, renewed, perfect in every way. This is our future. And because it is, oh, what a hope we have, what a hope of glory. What a wonderful future we have to look forward to. And so, Lord, help us to fix our eyes, not on things which are temporary, but on things which are eternal. Help us to fix our eyes, and as we hear this again from your word this morning, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, us, we're that joy. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, taking our shame upon himself. He won the victory. He sat down in eternal rest at your right hand, at your throne, and on your throne. And though our world is crazy and chaotic and mixed up and messed up and broken, you rule and you reign, God. You are working out your plans and your purposes in this world. You are working out your plans and your purposes in our lives. You leave nothing undone, and you leave nothing to chance. You are sovereign. You are in control. Good all the time, and you're good in all your ways, and we can trust you. We can trust you with our world. We can trust you with our country and our crazy politi politics and system. We can trust you with the brokenness and the messes of our lives, often of our own making. We can trust you in all things. Because you are God. Because you've shown yourself to be faithful 
true. And so, Lord, thank you for this day of Sabbath rest and worship and fellowship. Thank you for your provision uh, for us individually, each one of us. Thank you for your provision in our families, even through trials and struggles, loss and pain. Thank you for your provision for this church over 116 years and for the last few weeks that I've been away. You are good. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for death. Thank you for eternal life. Victory over death. Thank you for every good gift that's come down from the Father of heavenly lights to us through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive our worship this morning, this day. Receive our lives as living sacrifices in honor of the one who laid down and gave his life for us that we might live. Receive our worship. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in God's word this morning to Hebrews, the end of Hebrews chapter 11, the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12. Having been away for a few weeks uh, and not yet landed on a, a sermon series, which I, I, I generally prefer to do a series, whether it's short or long, um, having not yet landed on a new sermon series and with Advent just a few short weeks away, uh, I'm looking for some individual filler sermons for these next few Sundays leading up to Thanksgiving and leading up to Advent. And uh, I was led here this past week as one of these uh, filler sermons for this Sunday morning. I was led to the end of Hebrews chapter 11 and the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12. So our passage this morning, Hebrews 11 verse 39 through chapter 12 verse 3. Before we read it and consider it together, let's ask for God's blessing on the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. Father, may your, may your holy word be our rule for faith and life increasingly. And may your Holy Spirit increasingly be our teacher. May the glory of Jesus increasingly be our primary goal and concern in life. Bless now the reading and hearing of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 12, verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to this passage as we consider it a, a bit further this morning. So this morning, and this is probably, this is probably going to be a little bit different I don't know if this has ever been done before in the history of Lebanon Christian Reformed Church, and when you hear that, that might make you a little bit nervous. <laughs> but I hope it'll be okay. I trust it will. This morning, I would like for us to consider together, briefly, the great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by. And even more so, to consider the great Savior that we are united to in life and in death. November 1, uh, nine days ago, I guess, November 1, and perhaps some of you are aware of this, November 1 is regarded within some Christian traditions 
as what day? You know, November 1, All Saints Day. Right? Most of us are recognized that Reformation Day is October 31, but centuries before October 31, 1517, uh, the, the first Reformation Day, when Martin Luther posted those 95 theses, and by the way, just a really neat coincidence here, uh, at the end of uh, my two-week chaplain captain's career course, uh, on Thursday, October 31, that afternoon, uh, we were taken outside the U.S. Army Chaplain Center and School to take a, a class photo picture, which we did, and um, they, they put it on Facebook, and a few days later, I noticed that, that that Facebook post, I thought this was a cool coincidence, it was posted uh, on, th obviously, Thursday, October 31, at, in military time, using 24 hours, it was posted at 1517. That's 317 p.m. in the afternoon. October 31, 1517. Pretty cool coincidence on, on Reformation Day. Anyway, uh, that was a rabbit trail. I'll, I'll come out of it now. Um, where was I? Where was I going with that? Oh, anyway, Reformation Day. But, but November 1 is regarded with some Christian traditions going back to probably the 8th or 9th century as All Saints Day. And it has, obviously, a, a long history in the Roman Catholic Church, but increasingly, uh, Protestant churches are acknowledging All Saints Day, including Reformed Protestant churches, albeit with a different focus than the Roman Catholic Church, which on All Saints Day commemorates the saints and invokes the saints in prayer. Protestant churches who acknowledge All Saints Day do so by remembering the saints and giving thanks to God for them, for how God has enriched our lives and encouraged our faith and hope and love through the saints. And I hope you know this, if you are united to Christ by faith, friends, you are a saint. I'm a saint. You're a saint. It sounds, it sounds strange to say that, or perhaps to hear it, but it's true. In almost every one of the Apostle Paul's letters to the churches of the New Testament, he greets them and addresses them as saints, as God's holy people, fully recognizing that they're still sinners but they're also saints because a sinner saved by grace is a saint. That sounds perhaps strange to our ears to think of ourselves as saints or to think of God's people as saints, but that's exactly what they are and what we are. We are both sinners and saints. Reformation Day, we recognize some of the great saints, the reformers, Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, and Haas, and Wycliffe, perhaps. But often on All Saints Day, we recognize ordinary, everyday saints. Our family members, friends, and those of our church family. We remember them and give thanks to God for them. And in that regard and with that focus, I think it's right and good, perhaps, that we as Protestant and even as a Protestant and Reformed Church that we perhaps acknowledge All Saints Day and recognize, give thanks for the saints that have gone before. I think it's okay to do that. In fact, I think it's God-glorifying to do that because as we give thanks for the saints, ultimately we're giving thanks to God for His goodness, His grace, and His glory at work within them. In this past week, with, with the death of a dear saint from from this church, from this congregation in Elmer Bunema, who was a faithful member of this church for his whole life, his 92 plus years. And this past week, in light of Elmer's death, I, I, was, I was drawn to remember and give thanks for the saints from this congregation that have died in my seven and a half years here. It's 13 people. And I called all of them to mind this past week, and I had to be at least a little bit intentional about doing so to make sure that I remembered all of them and didn't forget any of them. But the 13 members that the Lord took to himself in my short time here, 
It's a relatively small number, but I think it's, it's right and good that at least on occasion we call these people to mind, and I think it's right and good that we even do so in worship. I want to invite you to join me in calling these 13 people to mind this morning to give thanks to God for them, for how they enriched our lives and encouraged our faith and our hope and our love. I'm going to do this pretty briefly, and I'm going to do it uh, via PowerPoint on the screen. Anna Van Driesen, born November 1, 1918, died September 1, 2012. I started here as an unordained intern in June of 2012 and, and got to know Anna just a few short months. But I was blessed and encouraged by her faith and by her lifelong Christian witness and testimony. And I give thanks to God for the life and the memory and God's grace to Anna Van Driesen. The next, Esther Vanderluck, born September 27, 1927, and died August 3, 2013. And again, got to know her just a little bit in the short time that I was here. And she too, I think, spent probably, she, she was, uh, what was her maiden name again? Okay, so she wasn't here her whole life, but all of her married life. And I got to know her a little bit as well. Remember and give thanks for Esther Vanderluck. Next one. Howard Zutenhorst. Born July 31, 1937 and died December 31, 2013. I remember that morning I was making last minute preparations uh, on, on a sermon early morning on a Sunday morning on that New Year's Eve day and got a phone call from Daryl that Howard had died peacefully, seemingly in his sleep that night and woke up to the new year, 2014, in heaven. And I give thanks for God's grace, too, in the life of Howard Zutenhorst. The next one, Rena Dragstra, born February 5, 1923, and died January 19, 2014. She was a dear saint, too. I always enjoyed my visits with her. And every time, Willie, I don't hear you say this phrase as much, but I've heard your brother Ken say it many times. Ken, Ken in, in conversation with Ken, you've heard him say this, too. And as he's thinking aloud, aloud to himself and coming up with the next words in conversation, you'll hear Ken say to himself, uh, what, what shall we say? And Rena would say that all the time, too. What shall I say? What shall we say? And she was a dear saint. We give thanks for Rena Dragstra. Next one. Rich DeBoom, born June 20, 1932, and died December 16, 2015. And like the others before, enjoyed getting to know him for the short time that I did, and give thanks for God's grace to and, and, and the life of Rich DeBoom. Next one. Chris Dragstra, born December 16, 1979, died March 14, 2016. Chris was the, he was the first person um, that I ever was present with as they died. And they're with the family. And I won't forget that moment, and I won't forget that day. And I sure won't forget the life and testimony of Chris Dragstra and God's grace in him, to him, through him, in the midst of great suffering, pain, through Huntington's disease. Thanks be to God for the life of Chris Dragstra. Next one. And how could I forget these little ones as well. Luke and Danica Richardson, conceived on a date only known to God, unless Joe and Alyssa, you can tell us with confidence, but taken home to be with the Lord on July 28, 2016, in many respects seemingly before their lives really even began, but yet they had begun and they continue, and they will continue forever. 
Joe and Alyssa, I hope you know again the confidence that you'll see them again someday soon. Next, Douglas Haverhalls, born December 27, 1950, died August 19, 2016. I remember Doug's funeral and saying that it was the first time I did a funeral for someone that I perhaps thought was someone of a, of a weaker faith. Not one of those strong saints in the Lord like some of these elderly folks that you just knew, you knew with confidence. But there was faith in Doug's life, I'm sure of it. Perhaps it was a weaker faith. But even faith so small as a mustard seed is safe in faith. And I give thanks for the life of Doug Haverhalls. Next, Gertie Bunema. Born February 7, 1919, died December 27, 2016. And I'll always remember Gertie and that she would, she would tell me every time I visited with her about riding horse, riding horse, riding horse when she was a youth and a teen. That memory, though many memories faded, that memory stuck. She would tell me every time about the joy of riding horse. I can, I can imagine that maybe the Lord would grant her a horse to ride on the new earth someday and that she would be able to ride forever. Thanks be to God for the life of Gertie Bunema. Next. Artie Bunema, born March 28, 1930, died July 11, 2018, and another dear saint, and a blessing not only to her family, but to this church family as well. Thanks be to God for the life of Artie Bunema. Next. Sievert Van Der Esch, born February 15, 1928, and died March 27, 2019. And what a great picture of that smile that we came to know and love. Thanks be to God for the life of Sievert Van Der Esch. And last but not least, just in this past week, Elmer Bunema, born July 3, 1927, died November 5, 2019. His body buried yesterday in our cemetery along with his three wives, which is a, a really fascinating thing as well to consider trusting that they're in heaven, have greeted him there, and that they're the best of friends. We know there's not marriage nor anyone given in marriage in heaven, but I trust that they would remember, I do, that they, that they were married here on earth, and that in, 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 in a glorified state and in perfection, uh, that they're the best of friends and will be forever. That's speculation on my part. We can have that conversation later. Each one of these 13, a life ordained by God, the number of their days ordained by God. And I hope we could all recognize and see God's grace in and to and through their lives and give thanks for their lives and God's grace in and to and through them, even as we hope and look forward to seeing them again. These are among this great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews 11 talks about. Of course, Hebrews 11 is primarily talking about when it mentions this great cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded by. It, yeah, it's talking primarily about these Old Testament saints, these heroes of the faith and the hall of faith referenced throughout Hebrews 11. But recognize, if you, if you glance over these heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, these are like any other of God's people. These are sinners saved by grace. These are sinners who by grace are saints. And they are, no, they are no more, no less than these 13 ordinary saints from our lives and our families and our congregation. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, since the New Testament, and from this church as well, and beyond in our families and our circles and our friends as well. Others of you have lost dear loved ones even recently, I'm aware. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, but even more so, friends, we are surrounded and we are united to a great Savior. Our passage continues after mentioning that we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And then it shifts and it tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, our Savior the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him, and that joy is us. It's the saints, those sinners for whom he would die to redeem. We are his joy, the ones whom he willingly went to the cross for. Jesus, our Savior, is the author and perfecter of our faith. 
And Jesus, for the joy set before him, for us, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and taking our shame upon himself, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured opposition from sinful men. Jews, Romans, some of his own friends, one of his very disciples. He endured opposition from sinful men, but he also endured opposition from his father. He was forsaken by the father in order that the father would never forsake us. As I think about these words about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, it brought to my mind uh, this little statement of faith from our contemporary testimony, Our World Belongs to God, about the person and work of Jesus, and I think it connects well to these verses in Hebrews chapter 12. Allow me to read from Our World Belongs to God. This is paragraph 25 about Jesus, who he is and what he's done for us. It says, standing in our place... Jesus suffered during his years on earth, especially in the tortures of the cross. He carried God's judgment on our sin. His sacrifice removed our guilt, our shame. But God raised him from the dead. He walked out of the grave, conqueror of sin and death, Lord of life. We are right with God, given new life, and called to walk with him in freedom from sin's dominion. Bringing these two themes together, that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we are united to such a great Savior, it brings this imagery to my mind. I thought about maybe trying to find a picture to capture this or a video to capture this, but I, I think if I share this verbally with you, you you'll, you'll get the picture. These verses together and these two connected themes of being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and being united to such a great Savior brings this image to my mind. It's that of running a marathon, something that I've never done and don't anticipate doing in my life. You probably don't either. In fact, I can't even, I can't, I can't fathom, I can't imagine running a marathon. I can't. It seems like it takes everything in me just to run two miles for the U.S. Army. And I was glad to do so in just under 17 minutes a couple weeks ago to pass my Army, annual, uh, my Army physical fitness test. It's pretty slow. Uh, well, what, seven, it was just under 18 minutes. 17 minutes, 50 seconds, a nice easy jog. But it met the standard, and I was thankful to meet the standard. That two miles was grueling for me, hard. I can't imagine running 26.2 miles without stopping. I, I can't fathom that. Perhaps some of you can fathom it. Has any? Katie, have you run a marathon? I thought so. Any? Uh, Levon, have you with her? Half? Have you done half? 10K? I know you... So, you, Katie, you know this. You've run a marathon. 26.2 miles. Did you stop? Just really short, right? Quick snack, quick drink. That's mind-boggling. Over what, four hours you did this in? Less than? I'm just thankful to run 18 minutes, let alone three to four hours. But this is a, a, a metaphor, friends, for the Christian life. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a short race. It's a long-distance race, which can seem impossibly long at times and grueling. Like we'll never get to the finish. Or we can't. That's a good metaphor for the Christian life. And if you can envision with me, as best we can envision running a marathon, this 26.2 miles, and you set out just at the beginning, and perhaps you're excited to be started, you're committed to seeing this thing through, you're joined by this, all these fellow runners, and you're joined by a crowd of people along the whole route cheering you on. And you're ready to go. 
But if you're like me, if I attempted to run a marathon, I guarantee you by mile two, I'd be thinking, I want to quit. I want to be done. I want to stop. This is not fun. I don't care how many runners are running with me, and I don't care how many people are cheering me on. This is hard, and I can't do it. But some way, somehow, and I know people well older than me who've run marathons, some way, somehow, they find the strength to continue on and carry on and keep running. And of course, as we apply that metaphor to the Christian life, that strength doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord. He gives us sometimes just enough to put one foot in front of the other. Keep going, keep going, keep going, knowing that the finish line eventually will come. And so picture yourself running a marathon, running with others, but also with a crowd, cheering you on along the way. And then if you can, if you can go there with me, picture Picture at the end of the marathon. Here's the finish line. It's in sight. You can see it. It's in sight. And the crowd now is at a fever pitch. And the the volume of the cheers and the encouragement, even though your sails are empty, somehow you're finding strength to continue on. But it's that finish line, not the crowd, not the noise, that is the primary focus. And that's what the author of Hebrews is saying, that yes, indeed, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that spurs us on and encourages us. But the greatest source of encouragement is at the finish line. It's the author and perfecter of our faith. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, who not only has won run and won the race for us, but gives us the encouragement and the power and the strength to start and continue and finish that race. And so as you run your race, be mindful of this great cloud of witnesses, including these 13 saints. But fix your eyes on Jesus, the one who calls you to himself and to the finish line, the one who has set you on this race, marked out for you and me, to run with perseverance knowing that through his strength, you can, you will finish. Thanks be to God for such a great cloud of witnesses. Thanks be to God for such a great Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our good and gracious God, it is good for us and for your glory that we would call to mind the saints who have gone before, those from Hebrews chapter 11, those Old Testament saints made, sinners made saints. Many, if not most, if not all of them were some sketchy characters who did some sketchy things in their lives, but they were yours. You claim them, you redeem them. You have sanctified and glorified them. So too with the New Testament saints and so too with the saints throughout church history and so too with the saints from this church as well. Those 13 that we've remembered this morning from the last seven and a half years and and perhaps we call to mind other family members and friends even recently that you've called to yourself. And as we remember all of the saints together, We're mindful indeed that, yes, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. In in your scriptures, our family and friends, and in our church family, people whose lives have enriched our lives and who, by your grace, have encouraged our faith and our hope and our love. God, thank you for the gift of remembering them and thanking you for them, for your grace and goodness and glory at work in their lives, which is the same goodness and grace and glory at work in our lives. Lord, we thank you for such a great cloud of witnesses, but even more so, we thank you for such a great Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has bought these saints, this great cloud of witnesses, that one day soon we'll join Thank you, Lord, for your Son who has redeemed us, your people, bought us back and brought us back from the curse of sin and death and hell and condemnation that we might belong to you in this life and belong to you forevermore in the life to come. 
receive our thanksgiving for the saints who have gone before and for your Son, our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two offerings this morning will be received to our deacons at this time. The first for our denomination's ministry shares, uh, going to a multitude, a variety of ministries and missions around the United States and Canada and indeed around the world. The second offering is for Ayrton Christian School. Responded to God's word with our tithes and gifts and offerings, let us stand together and respond to God's word together in song. For such a time as this, let us stand and sing. Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses and united to such a great Savior. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.